Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to discuss aspects of time conception with you. Time is a basic element of historical and archaeological interpretations. These disciplines consider time mostly retrospective. The alternative is prospective time perception. Against the baseline of linear and uniform advance of physical time, the difference to its subjective perception becomes visible addressed in many metaphors of everyday language. You know, time is run, running out, time is going by really, really slowly and so on. Closely related to time is our understanding of cultural change. Corresponding to physical time, theoretical change could be expected to be a constant. However, the concept of the longue durée of historians implies a long time of long of slow change. And the concept of the archaeologist Gordon Child of the Neolithic Revolution suggests implicitly a short episode of fast change with a dramatic increase of population. Because this term correlates population and revolutions in this talk, population growth or decline is used as a proxy for the speed of change. Concerning retrospective perception, also formation of memory and its relation to speed of change has to be discussed. In some cases, it seems reasonable to assume what I would name the change memory hypothesis. The more change, the more to memorize. For understanding of demographic development of mankind, different models exist. You'd see the reference of Whitmore and others at the bottom of the slide. Each of these representations is characterized by a specific scale of time and population density. Stöckli, for example, gave an overview of the prehistory of Switzerland based on a linear time scale. In fact, this corresponds to the dominant model normally used in our media. On the right, Edward Devey describes in his famous article in Scientific American, the global demographic development of mankind since its beginnings by means of a logarithmic time scale. Please notice the long span for the last 500 years and the short span between three millions and ten thousands. Another option is to analyze time segments of special interest. The child model with its Neolithic urban and industrial revolution often is at least partly, if implicitly, an element of many archaeological interpretations. In this approach, several time scales with different speed of change are distinguished. During the revolutions, speed of development is fast. These revolutions separate epochs of a longer durée with a much slower development. No of these representations is wrong, but each transports an own narrative and develops an almost manipulative power concerning the resulting interpretation. The message of the long-term linear time model is the exponential growth of human populations during the last centuries. Therefore, it is useful for scientists wishing to illustrate a late beginning of Anthropocene. In this way, a relation between the absolute numbers of humans to global warming is suggested. Closely linked is a concept of the International Geosphere-Biosphere Program it describes the great, by the term great acceleration, socio-economic and earth system trends between 1750 
and 2010 concerning human enterprise and the impacts on the Earth system. In an analogy to the change hypothesis, you remember, the more change, the more to memorize. We could formulate the position of the great acceleration as the time distance hypothesis. The longer ago, the less important for the actual development and the less to memorize. Rate of change in the remote past is considered low. For historians and archaeologists, however, the question arises if rate of change in the recent past is indeed singular. Perhaps the time distance hypothesis is so convincing because it is an analog to individual memory. At individual time scale, very early events become easily forgotten while most recent experience are reliably remembered. A method to compensate the effects of the time distance hypothesis is logarithmically scaling of time. The idea is to keep information density constant. By stretching the last time and compressing the remote past. I would like to argue that it is possible to test the operation of the time distance hypothesis by means of artifacts. This position is defendable if two assumptions are met. First, in times of rapid socio-economic change, also material culture is greatly modified. Second, while in times when tradition is considered very important, people judge innovations skeptically. It is interesting to see that this hypothesis is confirmed only for hunter-gatherer societies on the left. You see, the younger, the shorter duration of typochronological units. Therefore, logarithmically transformed age classes are optimal adapted to this kind of archaeological knowledge. Two arguments want to make this observation understandable. First, with increasing age, probability of loss of evidence increases. Second, small populations are expected to produce only a limited amount of innovations, while danger of loss of knowledge is high. In a review of the archaeological literature, Frank Siegmund has collected export knowledge concerning dating accuracy based on artifactual evidence of sedentary societies, you see on the right. The x-axis represent centuries before and after Christ, the y-axis representing duration of archaeological phases in years. This graph makes clear that chronological resolution does not deteriorate generally with age. Otherwise, we would ex should expect a relation similar to the red line. That the age hypothesis does not hold for sedentary societies, however, makes the just mentioned attempts to explain why that happens questionable. Loss of evidence due to age, age and limited innovative capacities in small-scale societies seem not to be able to explain the observed relation between age and change in material culture. Nevertheless, operating on the time-distance hypothesis could help to understand the archaeological record in some parts. Considering long-term developments, there seems to be a rough correlation of age and information density. The third time model I presented in the beginning is the child model. As already mentioned, he proposed the terms Neolithic and Urban Revolution following the prototype of Industrial Revolution 
and expected for each of these episodes of fast change the market population increase related to important economical innovations. Between these interruptions, long eras of slow change are suggested. As you see, these differences in an order of magnitude are between different epochs are corroborated empirically today by the results of different projects. Unified empirical estimations for the population density of the Upper Paleolithic were worked out at the European scale. For the times between Neolithic and 1800 AD, population estimations of red dots were developed for a region of about 30,000 square kilometers in the Rhineland. Upscaling these demographic estimations by the logistic equation and the size of archaeologically documented distribution areas at a central European scale results in a graph in good conformity with the child model. According to the change memory hypothesis, you remember, more change, more to memorize, such an alternative pattern of fast and slow change should result in consequences I would like to discuss under the heading punctuated equilibrium hypothesis. In episodes of fast change is more to memorize than in episodes of slow change. Such a discontinuous pattern has also an analogy in the individual development with a few phases of important change and episodes of continuity. Initiation, mating and becoming parents are situations of dramatic change. Psychological tests down here show that retrospective memory reflects this pattern. Similar in archaeology, there exists much more literature concerning the formation of states, urban revolution, and the uh, development of food production compared with equally long periods within the Neolithic, Bronze, or Iron Age. In this respect, historical knowledge is better developed for these short episodes with fast change than for episodes of long durée. Comparing cultural situations from different epochs, the central hypothesis of Robert Spencer from 1865, that is the a new um, outline of philosophy, he means evolution, seems to be correct. He has written, evolution is a change from an indefinite, incoherent homogeneity to a definite, coherent heterogene heterogeneity through continuous differentiation and integration. In this compressed wording, Integration includes aspects as formation of identities and size of cooperating group. Differentiation includes division of labor and development of social inequality. I would like to argue that this statement is often true if comparing cases from different epochs. Larger cooperating groups are often able to outcompete small scale societies. However, the Spencer statement fails in many cases, comparing societies from the same epoch. A second property of the child model is the existence of oscillations. He has written, progress is real if discontinuous. The upward curve resolves itself into a series of drafts and crests. You see the wiggle pattern at this side. You see here two such oscillations from Central European context with very good archaeological knowledge. Left from the early Neolithic, you see at the beginning of the band keramic, there are only a very few houses. It increases 
during time and then decreases again. And on the right hand side, you see that an example from dendrochronologically dated settlement on Lake of, from Lake Constance. Concepts attempting to interpret such patterns of booms and busts are often summarized under the heading cyclical time. If a specific property is related to time, you see time here, and in our cases, it's population at the, at the y axis, um, growth and decline are to be absorbed. Assuming that after decline follows growth again, these phases may be arranged to a circular pattern. Growth, decline, growth, decline. In this graph, the adaptive cycle, you see the reference down here, is used to illustrate this relation. It is a demanding task to distinguish and identify idiosyncratic and general causes for growth and decline. Evident consequences of these developments, however, are more or less frequent crises. The economist Joseph Schumpeter argued that a crisis comprises the option of a creative destruction. In fact, the socio-economic organization of succeeding oscillations in prehistory appears to be very different. For example, the basic social entity in the early Neolithic of Central Europe seems to be the household and its kinship ties, probably with a clan organization connecting different settlements. In lakeshore sites, the villages with streets and fortifications indicate common activities and a much closer cooperation of the group living together in the same settlement. In general, differentiation and integration differs between succeeding oscillations in a way which in hindsight is not predictable, often not predictable. It seems that with, which is new, with each new oscillation, a new kind of social organization with different kinds of living together is explored. In evolutionary terminology, social reproduction produces variability, allowing selective advantages and disadvantages to take effect. Therefore, considering a time scale of short duration, chance seems to be an important principle in historic development. However, considering long-term development, that does not falsify the Herbert Spencer statement, considering integration and differentiation. What remains to discuss is the validity of the great acceler acceleration conception in the present. In my opinion, it is relativized by the op operating of the punctuated equilibrium hypothesis. During child's revolution, already other times of accelerations are to be observed. What is more, extrapolating this pattern in the future makes us expect a phase of declining innovation rate in the coming centuries. Concluding, I would like to emphasize two results. Important theoretical theses are true at only one scale of time and not at the other. Robert Spencer's thesis was the chance development. It would be possible to avoid unproductive controversies by distinguishing statements valid only at a specific scale of time. And second, every time model contributes to the formation of the archaeological record of its understanding. You remember time distance hypothesis. In a way, it's true that for time long ago, uh, te written texts by archaeologists and historians 
are smaller than for later times. Also, the punctuated equilibrium hypothesis. In episodes of fast change, more literature appears. And the crisis hypothesis, well, sometimes it's true that with a restart, new kinds of socio-economic organization may be explored. Thank you for your attention.